Hello, welcome to the St. Louis Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. I'm Ryan, this is Lori, and together we'll be your docents as we take you on a virtual tour of this very special space. Judaism teaches you can honor those who've passed by learning and living righteously in their honor. As I'm the granddaughter of two local survivors who have since passed away, every time I give a tour, I'm able to honor my grandparents. And by you learning about the Holocaust and applying its lessons to make today's world a better place, you are able to honor those who suffered and perished in the Holocaust as well. This museum opened in 1995, where it was founded by many of the Holocaust survivors who came to settle here in the St. Louis area. Their stories are woven throughout the narrative of the museum, including with these photographs that were donated by local survivors. By looking at them, you'll see that the Jews of Europe were varied. They came of many different backgrounds from many different countries. Some were wealthy, some were poor, some were very religious, some weren't religious at all. They liked simple things like riding bikes and going to school and vacationing at the beach with their family. In short, the people who were affected by the Holocaust were ordinary people, just like you and me. Throughout the tour, I'll be sharing stories of my grandparents to make this seem more personal. My grandfather, Simon Cohn, was from Poland. He was the youngest and grew up poor and religious. My grandfather didn't talk much about his childhood or experiences during the Holocaust, but one thing I remember him saying was that he liked to skip school to go play soccer. Obviously, I don't support skipping school, but this is something we can all relate to. My grandfather was just 13 years old when the Nazis invaded Poland to start World War II. As his older brothers went away to forced labor camps, my grandfather wanted to be man enough to go, so he sought going to the labor camps to join them. Throughout the tour, we're gonna to be talking about Nazi deception. And this is just one example that my grandfather wanted to go to the labor camps. My grandmother, born Lanky Pollock, ultimately becoming Bobby Cohn, was from Boinhod, Hungary, a small town 45 minutes outside Budapest. Similar to my grandfather, my grandma grew up religious, but unlike him, her family was well off. She described her house being one of the most modern in the neighborhood with running water and electricity. She also had gymnastics rings and a ping pong table for her friends to come over and play. Since my grandmother was religious, she wasn't supposed to associate with boys, but she was still a teenage girl. So she'd find out from her friends when their brothers were going to be at their houses and arrange playdates with the hope to see and associate with the boys. We can all connect with trying to finagle ways to associate with someone we've had a crush on. My grandma also loved going to the beach. She spent summers on the Danube River getting so tan. Remember this fact for the end of the tour. When the Nazis invaded Hungary in 1944, my grandma was away with her sisters. She had a strange feeling, so she returned home and was deported with her parents and her brother. Her sisters stayed away, never going into the camps. Right here is my great uncle, my grandma's brother, Moshe Pollock, here at his bar mitzvah. A bar mitzvah is a coming of age ceremony for boys when they're 13 or girls when they're 12. You can see the religious books in front of him, as well as his payas, side curls in front of each ear, and kippah, a skull cap. While this photo shows him celebrating becoming a man, his life was cut short when he perished at Mauthausen. All the photos in this introductory gallery were donated by survivors who came to settle in the St. Louis area, one of which is Gus Schoenfeld. He's the young man seated directly in the center of this photograph underneath the rabbi and of his 1939 Hebrew school class. I want you to pay special attention to Gus because a mere six years after this photo was taken, he's the only one who will be left alive. All the others will have been murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators in the state-sponsored genocide that we know today as the Holocaust. And we know that they are not the only victims. Six million Jews perished during these events, a million and a half of which were children just like Gus. By looking at these photos and by seeing the faces, it is our hope that you'll be inspired as we make our way through the museum to remember that behind every one of those six million was a name, was a story, and was a human being whose memory we honor with this museum. And with that, we'll begin our journey discussing the start of the Holocaust and the rise of Nazism. This is the rise of Nazism. Immediately following Germany's loss in World War I, their punishments were drawn up in a document called the Treaty of Versailles that had three main points. First, Germany had to give up a lot of land. Germany had to shrink their army to where it was practically non-existent and no longer a threat to the rest of Europe. And third, Germany had to pay reparations. They had to pay the price tag for the damage done during the war. This hit Germany's economy very hard, to the point where their money, the Reichmark, was not worth the flimsy paper it was printed on. 
Here you see a man exchanging firewood, not for potatoes, but for potato peelings with which to feed his family. This gives you a snapshot of German society at this time. They're broke, bitter, embarrassed from their loss in the war, they have no jobs, and their families are starving. This is the perfect climate for a charismatic leader like Adolf Hitler to come into the spotlight, where at this point he is the leader of a small, radical, fringe political party known as the National Socialist German Workers' Party. We know them by their short name, the Nazis. Now, Hitler and the Nazis had a platform that was based on racism and hatred towards the Jews, or anti-Semitism. But at the same time, Hitler was saying things that the public wanted to hear. How if he were to be in power, he would rip up the Treaty of Versailles. He would rebuild the army. He promised each German Arbeit und Brot, work and bread. So as he's sharing these positive messages, the Germans elect Nazis at each election cycle so they are having more and more influence in the government. This makes one person very nervous in particular, that being the president of Germany, Paul von Hindenburg, who was no fan of Hitler, but was a big proponent of the idea that you keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So he comes up with the solution to appoint Hitler as chancellor, essentially second in command, hoping this will give him an opportunity to kind of keep an eye on Hitler, control him, to make him a little bit more moderate. In theory, this should have worked, but history has told us otherwise. February 27, 1933, someone sets fire to the German parliament building known as the Reichstag. Now this was a big deal, comparable to as if someone blew up our US Capitol building in DC. It would be terrifying, it would be confusing, but Hitler saw in this moment an opportunity he had been waiting for. He went to President Hindenburg and convinced him to declare a state of emergency that suspended the German constitution and the government itself to the point where Hitler and Hindenburg are the only two voices calling to the shots for the entire country. Now, Hindenburg is in his 80s, so what happens to him? He dies, leaving Hitler in sole control as the Führer, the leader, the dictator of Germany, without ever having been elected by the people. Now, as soon as Hitler is in control, the country is swept up in Nazi mania. No longer are people wearing their regular street clothes. Instead, they're wearing the brown shirts and armbands, the uniform of the Nazi party. The official greeting is no longer a handshake and a good morning, but the one-armed Nazi salute and the phrase, Heil Hitler. Even the flag of Germany changes to this, the swastika, the logo, the brand of the Nazi party, symbolically linking the country and the party as one and the same. Now, just because the Nazis are in control does not mean that Germany's problems go away overnight. They had to blame someone for them, so they turned to their old enemies, the Jews. The Nazis turned public opinion against the Jews through their genius use of propaganda. The idea that you spread a lie over and over again, it will eventually become accepted as the truth. Now, propaganda came in many different forms. Some were a little bit more subtle, like this fold-out photo depicting a Nazi party rally. At first, you're struck by the large crowd that is depicted, but this is a fake image. The crowd has been manipulated to seem much larger than it actually was. Now, why would this have been an effective propaganda tool? Well, imagine you're someone who's on the fence about Nazism. This picture might change your mind about speaking out and putting a target on your back. Propaganda also came in the form of racist cartoon posters, like this one, speaking out against degenerate music. The subject in this poster is a combination of the many different groups the Nazis hated individuals of African ancestry. The fact that he's wearing an earring symbolizes that he is a Sinti or a Roma, what you might call a gypsy. And how do we know he's Jewish? The big Star of David right there on the lapel. Now, from a modern sensibility, we wonder how posters like this could have been effective. But imagine, back in 1933, out of 100% of the German population, less than 1% was Jewish. And if less than 1% was Jewish, did many non-Jews knew a Jew personally? Most likely not. So if you don't know a Jew personally, how do you know that is not what one is like? How do you know that all the lies written about them in the state newspaper are not true? And that is the power of propaganda. The Nazis knew that if they wanted to plant the seed of hatred so that it blossoms in the future, they didn't need to target the adults who are already on board. They did, however, need to target the young people, the children of Germany. They did this in a variety of methods, including with youth groups. Boys were made to join the Hitler Youth that taught them how to be good soldiers. 
Girls, on the other hand, joined the Bundesdeutsche Mädel, the League of German Girls that taught them how to be good wives and mothers. Anti-Semitism even crept in to children's literature, including with a popular book known as The Poisonous Mushroom that symbolized Germany as a beautiful garden, the Jew as the poisonous mushroom. If you wanted to protect the garden, what must you do to the mushroom? You must eliminate it. Even in school, you could not be protected from the racism that existed throughout Germany. In the early days of the Nazi empire known as the Third Reich, Jews and non-Jews were still allowed to go to school together, but they certainly were not treated equally. As we see in this image here, where the Jewish classmates are made to stand in front and be embarrassed as the rest of the class reads the blackboard that translates to, the Jew is our greatest enemy, beware the Jew. We once had a local survivor who would tell of their accounts in school in Germany at this time, where each day would start with a Pledge of Allegiance to Hitler, and then their classmates would break into a cheerful patriotic song that contained the lyric, when the blood of the Jew spurts off the knife, Germany will again be free. School, a place where you're supposed to feel safe and protected, was anything but a safe space in the days of the Nazi regime. The Nazis tried to control everything from what music you listened to, to what newspapers you read, to what you learned in school. But they knew if they wanted to completely control how you think, they had to get rid of any opposing viewpoint. So in May of 1933, in towns and villages across Germany, book burnings were held. Nazi supporters would raid libraries, bookstores, universities of any book they considered to go against their ideology. As nightfall came, supporters would gather in large open squares with torches, listen to anti-Semitic speeches, and once the crowd was whipped into a frenzy, they would burn the books. Now, these instances got attention across the world, including here in the United States. After all, remember, in 1933, there was no internet. There was no television. If you wanted to learn something, you were getting your information from books. So this was a large step towards the Nazi program of brainwashing the nation. And so protest rallies were held in New York, Philadelphia, even right here in St. Louis. In reporting on the instances, American magazine Newsweek, in reporting about the book burnings for the first time to describe this period, uses the word Holocaust, a Greek word meaning sacrifice by fire. So you can see this symbolism of using that word to describe these book burnings. A century before any of this took place, a Jewish poet named Heinrich Heine once wrote, where one burns books, one will in the end burn people. In our next section, we focus on the Nazis' first targeted killings. In addition to Jews, there were many other groups of people that the Nazis targeted for hatred. The Sintian Roma, commonly referred to as gypsies, homosexuals, the mentally and physically disabled, individuals of African descent, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the list goes on and on. The Nazis were obsessed with the idea of race and that there was such a thing as pure blood and impure blood. And they felt that by allowing these other groups of people to simply exist would eventually lead to the extinction of their so-called pure Aryan race of blonde hair and blue eyes and athletic build. So they started to plot how to eliminate these groups of people. The first individuals targeted for destruction by the Nazis were not in fact Jews, but the mentally and physically disabled. The Nazis gave them cruel names such as life unworthy of life. The Germans attempted to eliminate this group in a program called Action T4. The Germans kept great records, and they knew where disabled people lived. One day, a family might get a knock on the door from a German bureaucrat who would say, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, we know you have a disabled child. Give them over to us. We'll bring them to a special institution and give them the best of care. This will free you to use your special skills to add to the greatness of the German Third Reich. Many parents gave up their children. Many didn't have a choice. But the special treatment that they were receiving was in fact the experimentation by Nazi doctors of how to kill large groups of people in an efficient manner. They experimented with starvation, with shooting them, with poisoning them. They quickly realized the most efficient way to kill a large number of people was to seal off a room or a van and pump it full of carbon monoxide gas, creating primitive gas chambers. We know that the Nazis will use gas chambers to a much larger, deadlier extent in the future. But this is where it started. Now you may wonder what happened with the parents. Would they get suspicious after not hearing from their children again? Well, the Nazis were able to cover their tracks. 
those same parents would get a letter in a box in the mail. They would say, we regret to inform you, your child caught influenza and they did not survive. The box would open and there in the box would be human ashes. Because where one burns books, one will in the end burn people. As news of the program began to leak to the public, protests began to break out, spearheaded by the German churches. This backlash against Action T4 was successful in driving it underground. However, despite the outcry, the Nazis were ultimately able to surpass their goal of murdering over 70,000 disabled persons. In our next section, we'll be discussing the rising anti-Jewish laws that took over Germany. Between 1933 and 1939, there were 400 separate pieces of legislation that defined, humiliated, segregated, and impoverished German Jews. Some of these laws were similar to Jim Crow in the United States, such as Jews weren't allowed to sit on certain benches or visit certain locations. Some were trivial, trying to take the joy out of Jews' lives, like Jews were not allowed to buy flowers, walk on the sunny side of the street, or own pets. Others cut into rights and had an economic consequence, such as Jews losing their German citizenship, doctors, lawyers, professionals being prohibited from practicing, and Jews forbidden from owning businesses. For my grandma's family in Hungary, the first law that impacted them was that Jews could not own a business. In 1939, her father had to hire a straw man, a non-Jew, to appear as the business owner. But in Germany, the German Jews lived with these restrictions and thought they would blow over. However, that changed in November 1938 from oppression by law to violence with Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, a pogrom, a state-sanctioned riot organized by the Nazis. Over two days, there was vandalism. Jewish homes, businesses, synagogues, and religious relics were destroyed. Firefighters were told to let the Jewish businesses burn, but extinguish them if they were to catch to the German ones. Jews were beaten, raped, and killed in the street. 30,000 Jewish men and boys were arrested and sent to concentration camps and later released. About 100 Jews were killed, which is obviously less than the ultimate 6 million, but at this point there had been no violence, so it was significant to the German Jews. Jews were taxed for the damage and forced to clean it up. Kristallnacht gave German Jews the message that anti-Semitism wasn't just going to blow over. So for the next 10 months, until World War II started, many German Jews tried to escape. This was a foresight that Jews in other European countries did not have. But to escape, they needed money, paperwork, and a country to accept them. Many countries, including the US, had quotas about how many Jewish refugees they were willing to accept. In fact, at the request of Switzerland, Germany started stamping a J on Jewish passports so these were easier to identify. Another way the Nazis started to identify Jews was forcing them to wear the yellow star so they could easily be discriminated against in public. Jews were also forced to take the middle name of Israel for men or Sarah for women. Next, we will begin talking about the organized programs of Jews trying to leave Germany. It is an often asked question. If things were so bad in Germany, why didn't the Jews just leave? Well, it wasn't as simple as packing a bag and going somewhere, you also had to find a country that was willing to take you, which was surprisingly difficult during this period. Now, following the pogroms of Kristallnacht in 1938, the United Kingdom did loosen their immigration restrictions to take in several thousand German Jewish children. However, they had the caveat that their parents could not come with them. It was understood that once the war was over, the children would go back to their parents in Germany. 16,000 German Jewish children were saved from an unknown fate thanks to this program known as the Kindertransport. But in many cases, after the war, they didn't have parents to go back to. Another tragic story involves the SS St. Louis, a German ocean liner that in 1939 carried over 900 German Jews to Cuba, where they had visas to emigrate. But once they arrived, the Cuban president decided not to honor those visas. In a last-ditch effort, the ship made contact with the United States, hoping that they would provide refuge to these Jews trying to escape Nazi persecution. But the United States refused, leaving them no other alternative but for the ship to return to Europe, where one-third of those passengers perished as victims of the Holocaust. Examples like the SS St. Louis sent a clear message to Hitler. The rest of the world doesn't want you, so they're not going to lift a finger as I go on with my goal to make the world Judenrein cleansed of Jews. 
Next, we'll learn about life in the ghettos of Eastern Europe. We noted that the Holocaust started in 1933 when Hitler came to power. And now, World War II just begins September 1st, 1939, when Germany invades Poland. Germany had a little over half a million Jews, a manageable number. But with the occupation of Poland, they inherited three million more. So what were they to do? The Nazi solution was to establish ghettos to contain all of the Jews in one part of town. The ghettos were incredibly crowded, with several families forced to share an apartment. The conditions were awful, with filth, disease, and starvation running rampant. Many people died in the ghetto, and it became a job to pick up dead bodies off the street. The train with regular poles ran through the ghetto on its normal routes. It had the windows blacked out, so they could not see the harsh conditions, but we all know it's human nature to still sneak a peek. The Nazis took the people's money and gave them ghetto currency. This was another way they impoverished the Jews. The ghetto currency was like monopoly money, that it worked in the ghetto, but not life outside. The Jews did work for the Nazis, thinking their lives would be a little better if they could provide value. Here, you see the museum founder, Leo Wolf, in the Lutz ghetto, sewing a German uniform. And here's another picture of teens doing this work rather than going to school. It was often the children who smuggled food into the ghetto, as they were the ones small enough to fit into the sores or under a fence to get out of the ghetto and beg for food. But if they were caught, as seen here, the child, his whole family, and possibly others would be killed as a consequence. While someone may do something to risk his own life, it puts greater weight on disobeying the Nazis when others' lives are at risk too. This was another way the Nazis kept control. Similarly, the Nazis instituted a Jewish council and Jewish police to control the ghetto. Jews would volunteer, thinking this was a way to protect their families and maybe get a little extra food. Really, these people had no power, and it was smart of the Nazis to distance themselves as the ghetto inhabitants became angry with their own people rather than the Nazis. As far as my grandparents, my grandfather never went to the ghetto because he went to the forced labor camp before people were removed from their homes. For my grandmother, the Nazis removed her parents, her brother, and her from their home. Someone in town was eager to take their house, and upon their removal, had a priest there with holy smoke to clean the house of the Jews. It was the only time my grandma saw her father cry. Her family was in the ghetto in her town for about six weeks. During that time, my grandma went to work on a farm so she would not take from her family's rations. Next, we'll be discussing resistance during the Holocaust. Resistance groups sprung up in over a hundred ghettos in Eastern Europe, where small bands of Jews rose up against the Nazis using both smuggled and homemade weapons. Revolts also took place in death camps and through the use of small guerrilla warfare forces, such as the partisans of Vilna, pictured here. They hid in the forest, they derailed Nazi trains and killed German soldiers. But violence was not the only method used in resistance. The Nazis had outlawed any practice of Judaism. And pictured here, you see women praying during the High Holy Days in the Lodz Ghetto, demonstrating what we know as spiritual resistance. The important takeaway is to know that the Jews of the Holocaust were not simply led away like sheep to a slaughter. They did fight back, even in those moments when the odds were greatly stacked against them. Next, we'll learn a little more about the deadly system of Nazi camps. With people gathered in the ghetto, it was easy to deport them to concentration camps. They were crowded into trains to travel for several days without food, water, restrooms, heat in the winter, or ventilation in the summer. Some died on the journey, but they were packed so tightly that when someone died, he would still be standing upright. Upon arrival at camp, the prisoner saw the sign, work makes you free. This shows the constant Nazi deception as they tried to limit fears and get prisoners to cooperate. This picture progression shows arriving at the camps and the life that resulted there. First, you can see the confusion of getting off the train. Realize that many times the prisoners did not speak the same language as the guards. Here, belongings are plundered. Once again, Nazi deception. They thought that they were getting relocated and needed their belongings. After getting off the train, there was selection. The Nazis separated the men and women and then sorted the able-bodied, those capable of work, from those who would go straight to the gas chamber. The elderly, disabled, children, and mothers with children would all go straight to the gas chamber. In addition to children or pregnant mothers having no labor value, 
The Nazis had another purpose here. Remember, they wanted a perfect Aryan race. So children and mothers with children represented the Jewish population growing rather than shrinking. When my grandmother arrived at Auschwitz, immediately her and her mother were separated from her father and brother. Her brother went to a labor camp where he later died and her father went straight to the gas chamber that day. My grandmother and her mother were selected for the able-bodied line. A cousin approached them and said, here, will you hold the baby? I left the diapers on the train. Again, Nazi deception. She thought she needed the diapers. When the Nazis saw my grandma's mother holding the baby, even though she was in the able-bodied line, they sent her to the gas chamber line, and that was the last time my grandma saw her mother. After selection, the prisoners' heads were shaved. The Nazis say this was to prevent the spread of lice, but survivors talk about finding lice everywhere. Really, this was the Nazis dehumanizing the victims and taking away their individuality. The hair was then sent around Germany to make pillows and mattresses. The prisoners' names were taken away and replaced with a number. Patches or dog tags identified the prisoners. Only at Auschwitz did they tattoo. While both of my grandparents went through Auschwitz, only my grandfather had a tattoo. As my grandma was Hungarian and arrived at Auschwitz in the fall of 1944, they had stopped tattooing at that point as they were sending nearly all of the Hungarian Jews straight to the gas chambers. But for the Hungarian Jews not immediately killed, many survived the camps since their time there was not very long. The Nazis kept incredible records, which would later come back to haunt them. They had a Pell roll call every day and noted which prisoners died overnight. The prisoners were forced to stand in burning hot or freezing cold conditions as they were counted each day. If they could not stand, they were shot. There was one day when my grandpa was too weak to stand and his buddies held him up and saved his life. Some of the work the Jews did had a purpose, whereas others, like here at Mauthausen, was a pointless manual labor of carrying heavy stones up a hill just as another way to kill the prisoners. My grandfather built roads and my grandmother made bombs. The factory she worked at was underground and she worked with hot phosphate covered from head to toe. She described the tension with this task of knowing that these bombs would be used to kill her people. Here, you can see the living conditions of several inmates crowded into bunks. While this uniform is an amazing artifact for us to have, it doesn't tell the full story. Prisoners only had one set of clothes and could not wash them, despite the filth, disease, and death all around. The patches show different identifications for different types of prisoners. Homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, asocial, political prisoners, Jews, and more. Here you see the cup for soup that prisoners had to hold. Survivors describe different rationales for this. Some would go to the front of the line, so there was guaranteed to be food, none would run out. Others describe going to the end, as there would be a little more substance at the bottom of the pot. While I just discussed the conditions of prisoners who are alive, the next section will cover the Nazi killing machine. What you're witnessing here is what's known as an Einsatzgruppen massacre. The Einsatzgruppen were mobile killing squads who followed the German army. Every time the military conquered a new town or village, the Einsatzgruppen would be tasked of rounding up all the Jewish residents of that town and eliminating them. Their victims would be led to the edge of town to a forest or a ravine where they'd be forced to dig their own grave, lined up and then shot into the pit. This is how one and a half million men women and children were murdered during the Holocaust. Now they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's delve deeper into this image, particularly with the perpetrators in the background. What are some things you notice? You may notice the attitude. Some of them may even look bored. Some of them may look very young, like this young boy right here. Someone who should be at school or outside playing with his friends being a child is instead being an active participant and mass murder. Notice that not all of them are, seem to be soldiers, such as this gentleman right here. Remember that these massacres and these camps existed close by to towns. People heard the gunshots, people heard the screaming, and every once in a while, they dropped in to see what was going on. And one final question about this image is, who took the photograph? The Nazis did. The Nazis believed that what they were doing was an absolute good, and they believed in it so fervently that they were doing right. They wanted proof of what they were doing. Next, we learn more about the Wannsee Conference and the birth of the death camp.
When you think of the Nazi system of camps, chances are there are a few names that pop out to you. Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau. But in actuality, there were tens of thousands of concentration and slave labor camps, transit camps, sub-camps, and killing sites across Nazi-occupied Europe. The map here details just a small handful of the most prominent sites. It shows concentration camps designed to hold prisoners in deplorable conditions, slave labor camps that use prisoners as forced labor. But in 1942, we see the birth of a new type of camp. In January of 1942, 15 top Nazi officials met at a villa outside the German capital of Berlin in what was known as the Wannsee Conference. Their task was to discuss what they called the final solution to the Jewish question in Europe. The final solution was their code name for their planned extermination for the rest of the Jews of Europe. They realized that the Einsatzgruppen massacres were not effective. They took too long. They wasted bullets that could be used on the battlefield in the fight against the Allies. And the work was also psychologically damaging to the soldiers who were killing women and children at point-blank range. At this meeting, they realized that an efficient way that they had dispatched of victims in the past was to use poison gas. And it was at this meeting that you have the birth of the death camp. There were six death camps located all within Poland, Chelmno, Majdanek, Belgic, Sobibor, Treblinka, and the most infamous of all, Auschwitz-Birkenau. These camps were planned killing centers. As prisoners arrived on the train, they'd be led directly to the gas chambers, but they would be told that they were taking a shower to help avoid a panic, and that they were going to de-louse. They were taken to a room where they were stripped naked, their valuables were taken. They were then led to a room fitted with fake shower heads so that prisoners would go in willingly. As soon as everyone was in the chamber, a guard would slam shut the steel door, and someone would pour Zyklon B pellets down a chute. Zyklon B was a gas used for rodents and bugs and was now used against human beings. Within a few moments, the chamber would grow silent as everyone inside was dead from lack of oxygen. Afterwards, it was the grisly task of a select group of prisoners known as the Sonderkommando to go in and clean up. They searched all bodies for valuables, extracted any gold teeth that would be sent to the German treasury. The hair of the victims would then be shaved, where it would be sent to stuff mattresses or create rope. The bodies would then be taken to a crematorium, where they'd be burned and the ashes unceremoniously dumped. Because where one burns books, one will, in the end, burn people. What started with words of hate and silly, racist cartoon propaganda posters became this. The genocide of six million Jewish men, women, and children, and millions of other individuals and groups targeted for destruction by the Nazis and their collaborators. At our next stop, we learn about the end of the war and the death marches. In 1945, as World War II was coming to an end and the German military was beginning to collapse, the Nazis frantically began removing prisoners from away from the front line of Poland in towards the interior of Germany on forced evacuations known as death marches, such as the one seen here that depicts local survivor Leo Wolf, who helped found this museum. The purpose of the death marches was to remove prisoners from the Allies so that they would not have talking evidence that could tell them of the atrocities the Nazis were committing. Death marches were long and hard. They began on trains and then transferred on foot, long distances in the bitter cold with little or no food or rest. If prisoners couldn't keep up with the pace, they were shot on the spot. At the end of 1945, in the spring, Hitler and some of his top aides committed suicide. Within days, the Nazi military surrendered and World War II in Europe came to an end. But as we know, though the Nazis were defeated, this is not a story with a happy ending. But with that in mind, let's turn our focus to those who did make a difference and provided help. There were those who made a difference to save lives during the Holocaust at great risk to their own. Anyone caught helping or hiding Jews would be punished, often sent to concentration camps along with them. But there are some inspiring stories. The country of Denmark saved nearly all of its Jewish population by arranging passage on fishing boats to nearby neutral Sweden. The Jews did pay for their way, but it would not have been possible without the coordination of the government. 
When so many German Jews were trying to escape in the late 1930s, Shanghai accepted them when so many other countries refused. The conditions here were not good, but the Jews did not have to fear for their lives. Some people in positions of power made efforts to help Jews. Raoul Wallenberg gave false papers to many Hungarian Jews so they could hide in plain sight. He was sometimes seen at train stations pulling Jews out of deportation lines, gifting them with these false papers. And there were regular individuals who risked their own lives as well as their families to help save their fellow human beings. One of these people was my grandma's neighbor who offered to hide my grandma's immediate family. However, her father refused as the neighbor could not accommodate the extended family. The neighbor even snuck into the ghetto before deportation, trying to convince my grandma's father to change his mind, even though he again refused. Had the neighbor been caught, he would have been deported along with the Jews. In the next section, we will discuss liberation. As the Allies made their way across Europe, they encountered camp after camp after camp. It witnessed horrifying scenes like this, bodies stacked like cordwood, survivors who looked like walking skeletons, the stench of death. Soldiers did not know what they were seeing. They could not comprehend these scenes. And many soldiers were angry, forcing local townspeople to march through the camps to witness the atrocities that were allowed to happen right under their noses. Some US military personnel, like General Eisenhower, sent word back to the US for journalists and photographers to come and document the camps. One person who answered that call was a local man, Joseph Pulitzer Jr., the editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. They took documentation of the camp so that no one in the future could say that the accounts of the Holocaust were mere propaganda. While today, Holocaust denial is at its highest rate it's ever been. Though liberation came, it sadly came too late. Two out of every three of the Jews of Europe were dead by this point. After the war, the question turned to justice. 22 of the top surviving high-ranking Nazi officials responsible for the Holocaust met judgment at what was known as the Nuremberg Trials, presided over by judges and lawyers of the Allied powers, including St. Louis attorney Whitney Harris. These perpetrators faced the charge of crimes against humanity. Now, many of the defendants admitted to the crimes that they were charged of, often using the defense that they were simply following orders given to them by superiors. In the end, 14 of these perpetrators were sentenced to death. Subsequent trials were held for Nazi doctors who committed cruel experiments or business executives who profiteered off of Jewish slave labor. But for the most case, perpetrators escaped without justice. Many camp guards, gas chamber operators, Einsatzgruppen squadrons, many of them escaped justice. They escaped to other countries, including here in the United States, where they lived perfectly ordinary lives, never paying for their crimes of the past. We continue on to learn about Jewish life in the aftermath in displaced persons camps. After liberation, where were the survivors to go? It was often easier for a Nazi to get into the U.S. and be denazified than for a survivor. Displaced persons camps provided short-term solutions for survivors to rebuild their lives and get vocational training. Many survivors met their spouses and had children in the DP camps. The camps were not especially comfortable, oftentimes cleaned up concentration camps, but the survivors were now free. When my grandma was liberated, she had typhoid fever and fainted, and a young man named Yannick caught her and took her to the hospital. He checked in on her, they became friends, fell in love, and Yannick proposed to my grandma Bobby. Yannick found another brother who had survived, and the three of them were hanging out at the DP camp. The brothers found out they had more family back home in Poland, but my grandma still wasn't well enough to travel. They decided since Yannick was older, he was gonna go home to find the relatives. His brother would stay with my grandma and they would all reunite in what at that point was Palestine and start their lives there. Yannick goes home to Poland to find several more brothers who had survived. Imagine the elation after being separated for so many years. However, the neighbors weren't happy that the Jews had returned. And after these people had survived six years of Nazi atrocities, they were killed in their own home by Polish neighbors. When Yannick's brother found out that all of his remaining family had been killed, he wanted to be dead with them. But my grandma, who was engaged to Yannick, said, no, we're not going to let hate win. I'm going to marry you. 
And Yannick's brother is my grandfather, Simon Cohn. My grandma nursed his soul back to health. Simon and Bobby got married, had a baby, and were living in Germany. A friend said to my grandma, I'm going to go to town to fill out papers to go to the US. Do you want to come? My grandma said, sure, I'll buy some kosher meat. When she was in town, she filled out the papers, because why not? Six weeks later, she found out that her family was sponsored to move to St. Louis. She'd never heard of St. Louis, so she pulled out a map. Remember at the beginning of the tour, I mentioned she used to like to spend summers on the Danube River going to the beach. So when she pulled out the map, she exclaimed, look, Simon, there are two rivers. We can go to the beach in the summer. Obviously, they were disappointed by the lack of beaches, but otherwise, St. Louis has been very good to them. And similar to my grandparents, many survivors thrived in St. Louis. They got jobs, went back to school, had children, and rebuilt their lives. Look at Leo's suitcase and how excited he was to come to St. Louis. Here, we have Gustav Schoenfeld, who you saw at the beginning of the tour as the only child who survived in the class photo. Featured here at Washington University, being honored for his work in helping to develop the drug Lipitor. As far as my grandparents, when they came to St. Louis, they were sponsored by Jewish Federation, the building we're in now, and the Holocaust Museum is a department of Jewish Federation. My grandparents came to St. Louis with only $300, so Jewish Federation helped them get housing, English lessons, jobs, and most importantly, gave them hope about the future. My grandpa worked odd jobs, such as a delivery man and a butcher, and in 1963, they opened their own restaurant, Simon Cohn's Kosher Deli and Restaurants, which today is the only kosher deli in St. Louis. My mom and uncle run it now, and museum visitors often enjoy lunch there after touring the museum. As I started the tour showing my great uncle at his bar mitzvah, who perished in the Holocaust, it is such an honor for me to end the tour showing my family at my bat mitzvah, taken 20 years ago. What is so special to me about my grandparents' story is that the Cohn family tree should have been destroyed. My grandfather wanted to be dead with his family. Yet, after surviving the Holocaust, my grandparents went on to have three children, eight grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren, with still many more to come. The Talmud, the book of Jewish law, says he who saves a life, it is considered as if he saved an entire world. And my grandparents' story really showcases this. In recounting the horrors of the Holocaust, we say never again. However, modern examples of hate, discrimination, and ethnic conflict show that society has not learned the lessons of history. The interactive exhibit, Change Begins With Me, discusses such contemporary events. As you saw in the tour, the Holocaust did not just happen overnight. How did Germany go from an educated, cultured society to one that murdered millions of people? This progression of hate shows how hate spirals downward. As I discuss the stages, think about how this played out in Nazi Germany. Also think of examples from your own life. We hope to inspire visitors like you to intervene at the earlier stages to stop the spread of hate before people get hurt. As I discuss the spiral of hate, I will use examples based around gender. My goal is not to offend, but to show the harm in going down this path. Feel free to pause the video to discuss your own examples at each stage. The progression of hate all starts with stereotypes, oversimplified beliefs or generalizations about a person or group of people without regard to individual differences. Stereotypes can be positive, negative, or neutral, but still involve making a general statement about a group of people. When we use stereotypes, we stop treating people as individuals. An example of gender stereotypes includes believing that women are more likely than men to be nurturing, whiny, good with children, and homemakers, while men are more likely than women to be independent, arrogant, good at sports or strong, and business managers. So I ask you, using one of these stereotypes, are all men good at sports? No, some are, some aren't. And some women are good at sports, while some women aren't. You see right away that the stereotype doesn't hold. And what's the consequence? Men who aren't good at sports may be criticized as weak, while women who are strong and competitive are demeaned as overly aggressive. The next level is prejudice, making negative judgments about a person or group of people because of race, social class, age, or other personal characteristics. Can you think of other forms of prejudice? Gender prejudice comes in the form of sexism, the belief that one sex is inferior to or less valuable than another sex. Prejudices lead people to make value judgments and assume what people can do or cannot do because of who they are, thus imposing limits on what men can and should do and what women can and should do. For example, the belief that women are less capable in leadership roles 
or men less competent at caring for children. Stereotypes and prejudices are ways of thinking. When those beliefs elicit action, that becomes discrimination, treating people worse than or better than others, usually based on bias about personal characteristics or group membership. Discrimination can involve denying access to services, organizations, or venues. A man getting a management job over an equally qualified female candidate or receiving higher pay for the same job are examples of gender discrimination. Following the prejudice that men are less competent at caring for children, family court cases tend to disfavor the father. Similarly, many new fathers do not get the option of paternity leave. Once targeted groups are deemed inferior and discrimination becomes acceptable, one can justify aggressive physical action or violence against them. Often, leaders will use propaganda to dehumanize their targets so that perpetrators can physically harm victims without feeling guilt. Victims of hate crime are targeted because of their association with a group deemed inferior from the norm. Not only does this violence physically harm the individual, but it also conveys disapproval to all members of the group. Human trafficking, often of women, as well as domestic violence, sexual assault, and rape are examples of gender-based violence. Finally, following targeted violence towards a specific group, the final rung on the spiral of hate is genocide, the deliberate and systematic destruction of an ethnic, racial, religious, or national group. To be considered a genocide, there must be the intent to kill an entire group of people. The Holocaust was a genocide. Genocides also occurred in Armenia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur, and elsewhere. What is unique about the Holocaust genocide is that it was completely state-sanctioned. While not all stereotypes lead to genocide, all genocides start with stereotypes and prejudice. What starts as a simple stereotype can quickly develop into prejudiced feelings and acts of discrimination. When left unchecked, these feelings and acts can deteriorate to violence and in worst cases, genocide. At the Holocaust Museum, we hope to empower visitors to speak out when they hear stereotypes and words of hate so they can stop the progression of hate before it intensifies. If you hear someone say it's stereotype, tell a racist joke, or use hateful words such as, that's so gay, respond with something as simple as, hey, that's not cool or please don't say that. While we've said never again, there are still events happening constantly at every step in the spiral. In October 2018, a gunman killed 11 Jews praying at a synagogue in Pittsburgh. In March 2019, a killer murdered 51 Muslims praying in two mosques in New Zealand. And in April 2019, seven suicide bombers killed 259 people, mostly Christians, in three churches and three hotels on Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. Taken together, these three incidents in only six months show how hate targets every one of us. No one is immune. So we challenge you in learning the history and lessons of the Holocaust, as well as modern examples of bias and discrimination, stand up and speak out in your daily life to confront hatred, promote human dignity, and ultimately prevent genocide. Mm -hmm.